Hi everybody and welcome back to another video. My name is Raymond Jett with ArcadeComponents.com and we have a series of videos I'm doing that are detailed out on the Aussie Arcade Forum in the repair section on circuit basics. And this is the second video in the series. We're going to look at clock circuits. If you remember from the previous video, if you, if you uh, watched it, we covered reset circuits. And we're going to go through each and every one of these simple circuits to help you get a better understanding of, of how all this works inside of your computers, your arcade games, and help you with repairing them. So we're going to look at why clock circuits are important. We're going to dive right in. Then we're going to look at some example circuits. And then we're going to look at dividing clock signals, which is extremely important in systems where you don't have a dedicated video controller chip. And then we're going to look at some troubleshooting of those clock signals. So why are clock circuits important? Like an orchestra without a conductor, like your synchronized swim team without practice, it's, it would be chaos to try to run either of those without somebody doing the control or something doing the control. The clock circuit, the oscillator, is key for your computer. Your computer is doing a lot of intricate work. A lot of different components are there and it needs specific timing for everything to work. You can look down on this slide and see where the read mode AC waveforms are. From This is from a 2716 EEPROM from uh, uh, SGS Thompson Microelectronics and it, it shows that in order for the data to be read you have to have a specific period of time that your address lines are valid and that your enable lines are set to the right state. Once that's done, then you can read the data out from that chip. Now, all this has to operate within very strict timing parameters. We're talking down into nanoseconds. And the clock circuit is what provides that synchronization for everything that the computer does. And you might have a lot more than just one clock circuit. You know, if you look at a, a typical like 8088 based computer, like the IBM PC, you'll find a, a, a clock chip, you know, a clock crystal on the motherboard. You'll find one on the floppy controller card. You'll find one on the video card. If you're using CGA, if you're using a, an 8-bit VGA, you might find two or three clock crystals on it. You'll find them on the clock calendar card, etc. But each one of them does a specific task and helps time specific things inside the computer. So let's get a little bit further down into the details. Now the clock circuits, this is where rocks, you know, just simple rocks, meet computer hardware. They use quartz crystals inside of these. Now we're not going out and harvesting quartz from caves or, or mines and using them anymore. They're grown in labs similar to the way they do silicone wafers for making computer chips because, let's face it, nature can be a bit messy. So when we put it in a lab and we do it, then we're going to get pure results and that will help with the yields on manufacturing. So we're going to grow the quartz crystals, we're going to cut them, they get ground down to a specific size and shape, and then they're going to do a metal vapor deposit on them so that we can attach some leads, put them into a housing. Now, there's a behavior known as a piezoelectric effect. And what this is, is if you bend it, it will generate a slight amount of voltage. But it also, if you put a slight about amount of voltage back in it, you can make it vibrate. And so in cutting this crystal and grinding it down to a specific thickness, specific size and shape, then you can get a specific frequency out of it. And that one is what you'll you'll see on the package, you know, 20.0 megahertz or 3.579545. And you might think, what's that? That's the NTSC color burst frequency. That's a very popular one. Or 14.31818, which is four times the NTSC color burst. And that's a common crystal to see in old computers back from the 80s. Now, they are mechanical in nature since they do have crystals inside them. They have leads that are attached to them. So if you drop them like a hard drive, yeah, you 
you're going to do some damage to them. So you, know, you could drop a crystal on the floor and cause it to stop working. So if you're repairing them or, or re, reworking a computer board, or if you're building a kit, you know, just be careful not to drop the crystals. Now they're mainly rated by the frequency and you can see the frequency on some of these in the picture. You can see that uh, number three, which is an HC49U package, that's 18.00 megahertz. The one to the right of that's 80 megahertz. The one to the right of that's 32 megahertz. So they're labeled pretty clearly until you get to the smaller sizes like two and one, you know, the uh, HC49 uh, surface mount or the, the short package. Sometimes you'll see those with the numbers on them for the frequency. Sometimes they'll have a number on them that's a code that you're going to have to look up to see what the frequency is. But they're all similar in that they all give you a signal out of a specific frequency. Now they're going to operate a little bit differently. Numbers 1, 2, 3, and 8 are crystals. Whereas numbers 4, 5, 6, and 7 or oscillators and you might think wait a second what are oscillators they're simply a crystal with an oscillator in a small package so what this does is it makes it a lot easier when you go to design a computer you, know, you need a certain frequency for clock rather than sit there and design out a circuit to give you what you want using a crystal maybe a chip, a couple of resistors, a couple of capacitors. Uh, you just pop one of these babies down on the board, boom, and Bob's your uncle. You've got your signal coming out that you need to time everything on your computer. And they come in a variety of different packages, the DIL 14, DIL 8, you know, think of that as DIP, you know, dual inline package. Uh, those are dual inline leaded. They are the same pin form factor as a just a regular 14 or eight pin chip. You know, that you want to plug into a socket on a board. Uh, the crystals, uh, you'll put those actually into a machine pin socket since they have round pins on them. You don't want to use those with a regular single or dual wipe socket. Now this gives you a nice easy way to do things, but it comes at a bit of a higher component cost. But you can think of them as just a simple black box. You, you have this box, you give it power, you give it ground, and you get a signal out. Now there's a little twist to some of these, and I ran into this in fixing a uh, Captain America and the Avengers uh, Data, Data East, a deco board, in that you might run into a VCX, a variable crystal oscillator. And this is one where you have pin one, which is normally typically not connected. Uh, you have to give it a voltage. And this was weird because you you, you put it on, and the board was dead. You touch pin one with your finger. All of a sudden, the board comes to life. Then you go look at the data sheet and discover, oh, it's a VCXO, variable crystal oscillator. So with that one, you have to give it a voltage on pin one that you can use to tweak the output frequency. So on this particular one, two and a half volts was what you would need to have it on frequency. And then you could take it up to five volts or down to, to ground and tweak it. In this case, for this particular one, 20%. You, know, you can go up 10%, down 10% for you know, a 20% swing. Uh, with that one, I had to put a resistor from five volts to pin one and from ground to pin one, a, a voltage divider, to get that voltage set right and get the frequency on the nose. Did that, boom, board work beautifully. It was very difficult to find a, a crystal oscillator of that specific frequency. And sometimes you might run into that, so it may take a bit of digging to find something, especially when you're dealing with something that's not a standard frequency that is an easy one to buy you know, right off of a, the shelf at Mauser or Newark or one of your other distributors. So what does the clock circuit do? Basically synchronizes everything in that computer circuit, whether it's an arcade game or a computer, whether it's your digital watch, etc. You'll see that you have a clock that pulses up and down, up and down, up and down. And everything the microprocessor does is based on that clock, whether it's a rising edge or falling edge, it times what happens on that system. Now, if you look at a Z80 CPU, you read the data sheet, it'll tell you one clock period is a T, a time cycle. 
three or more clock periods is a machine cycle. And you'll notice here in this diagram, there's also a wait state. And a wait state just adds more cycles to more clock periods to that machine cycle to allow you to have slower responding circuits. Now, all of this, everything is timed off that clock, the address lines, the memory request line, the wait line, the read lines, the write lines, the data coming out of the chips. All of that is based on synchronization provided by that clock circuit. This timing enables that valid and proper access to all the components in the computer, whether it's memory, your floppy disk, your IO ports, your video, etc., all the circuits that the CPU needs to do or to, to, uh, to work with in order to operate. And what does it look like and how long is it? Typically your clock signals will have a duty cycle of 50%, which means it's up 50% of the time, down 50% of the time. And you can see the theoretical clock pulses here on the, on the, uh, the graphic. It, it looks nice and square, beautiful, but in reality, they're going to look pretty ugly. And you may see overshoot you know, where the, when it goes up, it, it shoots high, then comes back down a bit to the flat part of your, your, um, your, your high or your low signal. You may see some rounded edging, and that's going to depend on the quality in the circuit, the components, but also on your test equipment. Because when you're dealing with an oscilloscope to view these, you want to make sure that your oscilloscope has at least 2x the bandwidth of the highest frequency that you're measuring, preferably more. The higher the bandwidth, the more accurate the representation of that signal is going to be shown to you on the screen. So get the highest bandwidth you can afford. Uh, you want to see good, strong, sharp rises and falls on the signals. And you, you're you not going to see that if, you, if you're working with one of those cheap USB things that maybe has a 100 kilohertz or 1 megahertz of bandwidth. So get a, a real proper true oscilloscope and uh, you, you'll see a lot better results when you're when you're doing your troubleshooting and looking to see what's going on on the system. And also properly set the probe compensation. When you hook a probe up, you have typically a, a just a standard probe is going to be a 1x slash 10x. And when you put it in 10x mode, there's a little little uh, variable capacitor on the control somewhere. It's either on the probe itself or on a little box on the plug where it plugs into your oscilloscope. So you'll want to go in and put a put the oscilloscope in if it has one of those modes that gives you a one kilohertz signal. You, know, you hook it up to that and you adjust that to give you the squarest looking wave possible. So that gets you your proper probe compensation so that when you have these waveforms on the screen, they're more accurate. Now let's look at some example circuits. In the old school method, they use transistors. Now you can see on the screen here, I've got a, a picture from uh, the schematic for an Apple II Plus, and they used a couple of transistors to drive the crystal oscillator. And that's easy. I mean, it, it works, but more commonly, you'll find things like a 74S04 or 74LS04 or 74LS368 that those chips have the ability to, to drive into what they call the linear region, where you can actually use them to drive the crystal and create the pulses necessary to run the system. Now, you'll find some variation on these depending on what the what crystals they're using. You know, you've got crystals that operate in, in uh, series or parallel. Uh, then you also have overtone crystals which operate in a, a method of, you know, you multiplying, multiplications of whatever the specific value is you're looking for. So there's different types of crystals. So make sure that when you replace one of these, you get the right type. Uh, also, the components that you have in here may cause you some headache, and I'll get to that when we get into troubleshooting, especially around that dig dug you see on the bottom left of the screen. Now, next up would be a crystal oscillator. Crystal oscillator, remember those black boxes? Actually, they're a little silver box, usually metal case. Uh, they greatly simplify that circuit. They increase reliability, you know, reduced part counts. They're sealed components. They take up less space 
on the circuit board than all the other discrete components that you're using. Uh, they're easy to troubleshoot. Do you have power? Do you have ground? Do you have a signal coming out of it? Now, you might not see the signal coming out of it if you're using a logic probe. We'll get to more of that when we get into troubleshooting, though. Uh, you might also find a system that could use either one. And if you notice at the bottom right of this screen, we've got an Apple IIe schematic. And they had a section of the board set aside to where it could use the oscillator or they could use the transistors and the crystal and the resistors. It just depends on what was available at the time they were doing the manufacturing uh, and what the costs were. Let's face it, sometimes you can find components cheap. Sometimes they get to be really expensive. It just depends on supply, demand, and scarcity. You know, the, the more scarce it is, the higher they, they cost. It's kind of like buying some of your uh, Atmel CPUs right now with all the component shortages that are going on through 2021 uh, they're unavailable through most of the suppliers and if you go to the chip brokers uh, i got a quote for one that was uh, it was a little over 25 dollars each in quantity 100 which is crazy considering the ic is normally about you know three bucks <laughs> So let's talk about dividing the clock signals. Now, when you're dealing with a computer, you typically have a video controller. I mean, look at VIC-20, a Commodore 64, and look at your TRS-80 color computer. You know, you have a video chip of some type in, in most of your computers. So it's pretty straightforward. You have a clock crystal that gets divided out for a couple of things, and then that's it. Uh, when, but when you're dealing with arcade uh, games, you're dealing with something that doesn't have a video controller chip for the most part. Uh, in this case, we're looking at Pac-Man from uh, Midway. And what they use there is they use a, a series of chips to generate different pulses, different video signals of different timing so that they can go out and look at, okay, this is the horizontal clocks, these are the vertical clocks, so that we can add them up and use them to position specific graphics at very precise points on the screen so that when Pac-Man's running around the maze, Pac-Man is actually running in the channels where the dots are and not over in the walls or between the walls or in the pen where the ghosts are. And they used the 74LS74 and the 74LS161 chips to divide the clock. These are very common. You'll find these in a lot of arcade game boards. You'll find them in Centipede and a variety of others. Because they, they do a great job at, at dividing the clocks. Now, in Pac-Man, they're going to use that LS74 first. And you can see that at the bottom left of the graphic. Uh, this is just a, a capture of the schematic itself from uh, Midway slash Namco and they're going to divide out the master 6 megahertz clock which is actually a 3 divided of an 18.432 megahertz clock you can see the crystal up at the top of the of the schematic divide that out by 3 to get you 6 megahertz that runs everything you know they divide that out further so that you have all your timing components the CPU is going to run off the 3 megahertz the 1H uh, then we're going to divide that out further into 2H, 4H, 16H, 32, 64, 128. And then there's a 256H. Uh, and if you recall from the, the talk with the um, reset circuits, the bar over it just means it's active. It's flipped. So it's going to be the opposite polarity. It's going to be basically uh, what you would consider active low. But if you looked at the clock side by side, you would see that one of them where one's active high, the other's active low. Uh, not active low, but I mean, when one goes high, the other goes low. So the 74LS74 divides that six megahertz clock down to a three, and then sends that output goes up to the LS161, and then it divides that out again by half, again by half, again by half, again by half, and then its overflow, <clears throat> its carry out, goes to the second LS161 to, configure, to continue dividing it further and then for the vertical clocks they're going to use the horizontal sync to divide that out and so between the horizontal sync periods where your left side of the screen and your right side of the screen we're going to go divide that out so that we can see 
what the vertical is and get the positioning necessary for that. So if you look at it on your oscilloscope, you'll see the 3 megahertz gets divided out and you'll see a 1.53, then that gets divided down into a 4H clock, which is 7 .6, or 767 kilohertz. Divide that out again, you get the 8H, which is 383 kilohertz. Divide that out again, we get the 16H, which is 191 kilohertz. So you can see how each step we're dividing it down uh, by half. Now, if you're missing these, you'll get a variety of crazy things happening. You'll get graphics that are mispositioned on the screen. You'll get graphics where they move, then they disappear, and then they show up on other parts of the screen. Uh, sometimes you'll get it to where you just don't have vertical or horizontal synchronization because a, a key clock signal is simply missing. Uh, other times you'll get it to where it just won't boot or it just crashes and repeatedly tries to boot stuck in reset you know that watchdog that we talked about during the reset video so let's look at troubleshooting clock circuits now it's easy to see most of this if you're using a logic probe but keep in mind that with a logic probe all you're going to see is blinking lights unless you get one that has the audio beep function and for those of you that have, have seen some of my other videos, you know I'm very big on the audio beep function because that lets you hear more about what's going on in the, in the circuit. So when you're listening to the clock dividers, you'll hear a difference in the audio tones as you check the different outputs. As it gets divided by two each time, you'll hear a difference in your ear, which makes it a lot easier to tell if that is being divided out properly. Now, when you're dealing with a logic probe, and you're looking at your master clock, uh, most of them only go up to 25 megahertz. So if you go beyond that, it may be that the clock is too fast for the lights to show. So you would use that mem function. You would put it on the hit the mem function, and if the light lights up, then you know the, the clock is oscillating. Now the oscilloscope, it's just going to simply show you the, the clock signal on the screen and with a quick glance you'll see where it is in relation to ground for the the low and in relation to how many volts it is to the high so in this screen the uh, the low signal is just uh, maybe about uh, you know two tenths of a volt at the most you know, off of ground and the logic high is sitting at about four volts so that's a good swing for TTL logic now, other oscilloscopes will measure that for you. They'll tell you the frequency and a whole lot more. But if you notice, there's a grid on your oscilloscope. So if your oscilloscope is calibrated, uh, on some of them, you'll have a knob that you turn and it widens out your time base and it clicks into cal mode. Well, that's calibrated mode. That means if, if it clicked, then you see on, the, on my screenshot here where it says 1.00 microseconds. So that means that every grid spacing is one microsecond. And you can use that information to calculate the frequency of what you're seeing on the screen. It takes a little bit of math, but you can get pretty darn close. So if you have no pulsing, always start with your eyes. That was one thing that was drilled into me by my uncle who helped mentor me in, in uh, electronic troubleshooting. You're always going to look for things like physical damage. You're going to look for things that are broken, corroded, gouged, uh, missing, uh, bent out of shape. You know, just things that don't look like they should. Also, you're going to look for dark spots that will help you identify bad components. Um, where they, they've just simply gotten too hot and they've cooked the circuit board around them. Um, also use your ears you know what do you hear do you hear the uh, the monitor squealing at you doing crazy things uh, next you're going to look at you know is it a faulty ic or a transistor or a crystal or a crystal oscillator now one of the tricks i like with using a logic probe is i'll put my finger on the logic probe tip and use that when i'm going and probing things and sometimes you'll see a circuit just spring to life uh, you got a fault with that gate that you're sitting there probing so replace that chip that might be an added bit enough to kickstart things to help you with that 
Now, also, you can try tapping gently on the crystal or on the oscillator. And if it does start up, then replace it. It's faulty. Also look for bad or open capacitors. And when I say this can be hard to figure out, in a dig dug, I had that 100 picofarad capacitor at C69 that was absolutely open. And this one was crazy because the monitor would squeal like mad. Sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. And the clock circuits were just going bonkers. And what had happened was it has a, um, oh, let me see, an 8.432 megahertz uh crystal in it if I remember, uh, uh, or sorry 18.432 megahertz crystal in it and with that I was getting over 54 megahertz I was getting like a third overtone and it took the oscilloscope to see it it was crazy the the circuit was just going bonkers and replacing parts replacing parts and I get down to okay these resistors are good this C10 lift a leg out it reads good c69 lead read pull leg out it's like wait a minute nothing replace it boom board powered right up beautiful worked like a champ so look for those types of things if you have your your clock circuit going bonkers especially if the, if the frequencies are way off check the capacitors now if you're missing your dividing clocks that's pretty simple because you could check the inputs, make sure you have your clock going into it, make sure your control signals are going into it. And if those are there and correct, then just simply replace the chip. Uh, the LS161s are a very common failure item. In Pac-Man, they'll tell you, hey, you're missing clocks, replace these chips. And it, it takes care of most of those clock problems. If your inputs or control signals are missing, then you got a little bit more troubleshooting to do. You're gonna to have to go backwards in the circuit. You know, like in the case of Pac-Man, if you're missing it at the LS161, then go back and check that 74 LS74. Do you have your clock signal going into it but nothing coming out? Replace it, power everything up, check again. See if your problem's resolved or if you now have signals but yet your LS161s are faulty. So some things to remember. From our last video, the thing to remember is that power and clocks need time to stabilize. And so the reset circuit is going to give you a guard time. It's going to give you, you know, typically 50 to 100 milliseconds uh, time for that to stabilize before it goes and lets the CPU run. The clock circuits are going to come in many different forms, but no matter what form it is, they all have the same purpose, and that's to synchronize everything that's going on in the system. And then start with the basics when troubleshooting. Look at your master clock and work your way down to your dividers. Don't start at the, at the bottom and work your way to the top. Start at the top. And then if you have an oscilloscope, use it. It will give you the most information quickly on what's going on. Uh, and if you're using a logic probe, if you don't have one with the audio beep function, throw it in the drawer and order one with an audio beeper. Once you get to know how that works and you get a feel for it, it will be your go-to tool. As you can hear things and hear differences in the circuits as you go down that clock divider chain. And then lastly, of course, don't drop the crystal. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for your time. And if you hit like or subscribe, it'd be much appreciated.